actually. All right, I'm going to start into a patch set that I just recently submitted today. Uh, this talk is about XSM and role-based security for Zen. All right, so the purpose of today's talk is to, like I said, was to go over the, the patch set that I recently submitted to the, uh, uh, the kernel, uh, the Zendevel mailing list. Um, as the objectives of this talk, as we dive into this, is we're going to, I'm going to go over the context and the motivation of, of the XSM roles work. Um, we're going to kind of dive into what the major function areas of responsibility within Zen is today. I define what the distinct roles for domains within those for, that take those responsibilities or delegated those responsibilities. Um, kind of establish a base understanding of the security controls in Zen today. We'll go and from there we'll go into what exactly is XSM and then explore how that drives down. All right. So the motivation behind XSM roles. Uh, I'll try to speed up a little bit for the last time. I apologize. Um, so this kind of started out as we were working through hyperlaunch, uh, the design sessions there. Uh, one of the requests we received was to do a work um, to formalize what it, what the control domain was in the hardware domain, because that was one of the motivating factors for hyperlaunch was to enable um, launching systems with the separation. Um, while looking at that, or during those discussions, another aspect that was pointed out was the um, the pass-through privileges uh, were actually split. So the PCI pass-through privileges were actually split between both the what is the hardware domain and control domain as it's defined in the current today. Um, so we went down this path of looking how do we how do we resolve this? How do we uh, enable this uh, for hyperlock? And when we were looking at the uh, is control domain and his hardware domain specifically, a couple of conclusions were were drawn. Um, for one thing, Zen already had a loosely defined role-based access control model in it. And two, um, there was a little inconsistencies on how that was implemented throughout the, uh, the hypervisor. And so a larger overarching view of these functions that a domain could perform needed to be abstracted and, and provided in a, uh, a concrete manner. So that is what brought it, started the path down to, to XSM roles. So to understand this, to, to, to start taking a look at the security controls within Zoom today, um, there's actually two sets of security controls. Um, one is the type of domain checks that you have throughout the hypervisor. Um, you know, this is the, if you've been inside the code, you've seen it, it's the is control domain, is hardware domain, and so on, so forth. Um, I believe there's actually a couple more that I didn't capture here. But the idea here is a lot of these are not necessarily privilege checks, but just checking for the role that a domain is, is functioning in. Um, so that way it can be decided on whether or not an action was appropriate. And, and then there's the fine grain XSM control checks or the XSM hooks that are distributed throughout the uh, hypervisor itself. And these hooks are what's used to enable one or more policy modules. Um, which are the you know two more well known the dummy policy and the flash policy and then the, as well as the silo policy. Um, the dummy policy is not exactly what I think something uh, is an interesting one. Some people may not be aware exactly how that one is working. Um, so, so that brings us to what are the roles after after looking at the list? What are the roles, core responsibilities that in the Zen platform? Um, and so, you know, kind of walking through this, this is what I, you know, I kind of distilled down to. So there's the platform host itself, right? That is the entity. And what you need to be able to do with that entity is you need to be able to manage it. So these are your general operations to manage the host, set up boot, um, EFI variables, um, manage uh, power management and and things that happen at the platform level that's not necessarily specific to a single domain. Um, then there are domains. And within for, for domain objects, you have construction, deconstruction, 
or destruction. Um, and then you have the life cycle management of them. And these are fairly straightforward. Um, or the construction destruction is fairly straightforward. Uh, the life cycle one is, is, can get a little fuzzy. What we wanted to stay focused on is that life cycle management of the domain is to manage its running state, whether it's running, it's paused, um, what its runtime configuration is, what devices have been configured for it, how plugging those devices in and out. So these operations that are managing uh, what is happening with a domain. Then you get to the virtual hardware that's being provided for the domain. And there are actually two types, right? There's the emulation and there's a uh, backend driver, uh, device driver domain. So um, I think this is pretty straightforward. These, you know, there's the role to provide emulated hardware for a domain, and then there's the role to provide a backend driver for one or more pair of virtualized devices that are attached to the, um, the front end in one or more domains. Um, and then you have the physical hardware. And so when you look at the physical hardware, this is the other one that gets, um, we took a little bit of reasoning about. So the first role that a domain could be doing with the physical hardware is provisioning and deprovisioning it, making, preparing the hardware and, um, uh, discovering the hardware, preparing it so that it can be made available to the hypervisor, um, to provide through to, as a passer device to a domain. And then as well, inform the hypervisor when the hardware is no longer available and take care of the, uh, the takedown process. Then you have the life cycle management uh, of the physical hardware. And the, the, this is the one where it, um, it became a little fuzzy, right? Because what, how much of this is really about managing devices versus managing the access of devices to a domain? Um, and really what we wanted to focus on here was this is specifically the adding and removing of the hardware to a domain, ensuring the hardware is in, in a good state before and after assignment. Um, and the general care and feed of the hardware itself um, when it's not being managed by the domain. So with this understanding of the roles um, that are possible in then that, now let's take a look at how XSM itself is uh, set up today. Um, so when XSM, the XSM hooks are always present and they're always invoked within the advisor. Um, when you build Zen and you have the XSM K config option disabled, the dummy policy header file, which has a uh, one for one definition for every XSM hook in the hypervisor kernel gets included directly into XSM.h, which is then how those hooks are, uh, the back end, the implementation of those hooks get called. Um, when you turn XSM on, instead of that dummy header being applied to the XSM.h, the dummy header actually winds up getting put into dummy.c and called, um, called as hook functions as opposed to just straight straight uh, static and line function calls uh, when you turn it off. So as far as the operation itself, the operation is exactly the same. It's just whether or not the invocation when it comes to the dummy policy, dummy policy is whether it's called directly or called through a hook or through a function reference. Um, so it's taking that understanding and realizing, okay, the dummy policy somewhat um, recreates that same role model that is pseudo um, present inside of the uh, inside of the hypervisor today. So let's take that, um, solidify that. So, so when we start to walk down the deeper, right? So we know what the roles, the general roles are. We see how XSM is hooked into the system for the dummy. Now we look at what that dummy policy did in terms of what a control domain can do and what a hardware domain can do. You see that you got this mapping that today the control domain is granted all responsibilities when no home hardware domain is present. When the hardware domain comes along, the physical hardware provision deprovisioning roles 
the hardware lifecycle roles and the virtual hardware emulation all are for to from the control domain to the hardware domain. And so the dummy policy just continues to enforce this. So when we're looking at the and uh, diving even further into these details as far as this goes, as far as XSM is concerned, you get these fine grain control checks and the selectable policy comes in and makes access to support. And as, as I highlighted, so these the hooks are all the way through the hypervisor. Uh, when these hooks are called to the dummy policy, they're called into a dispatch structure um, to, to get you into that hook call. And then the, the XSM4 is just an initializer that helps set all this up for you. And then, then you have the policy modules. Like I'm highly focused on the dummy policy because that's what we're actually involving here, um, and as well as the silo. Um, but each of these have their own hooks into it. So, what is XSM roles now? Now that we have kind of laid in into the detail of how XSM is working, how we have is control domain and is hardware domain um, implicit checks. Um, what we did is we came up with XSM roles, which is to create a coarse grained role based access control mechanism. Um, and I highlight that very strongly. We are not trying to create anything for um, anything kind of finer grain at control than um, just a basic role assignment uh, solution. If you want finer grain, do not be using access and roles to do that. This is where Flask is really the preferred and highly recommended if you want to do much finer grain control over what domain has access to what resources in the and the Zen system. So when when we do this and we've looked at all of this work that I've kind of quickly stepped through, um, one of the things that was identified is that we have these implicit and we have these explicit roles that a domain can fulfill in a, the life cycle of the Zen system. Um, the roles are not fixed to be a one-to-one -one relationship with a domain. So a domain could have one or more roles or no roles within the system. Um, a role could be assigned to multiple domains, um, where it all makes sense. Um, and there is no concept of delegating these roles um, for those that think about capability systems, where you can delegate a capability to a child. That is not what's going on here. This is a very um, straightforward role assignment. You get a role, that's what you do. You use it to, to care, take care of the operations you need to do, and when your life cycle ends, you you the, the role is relinquished less more or less. Um, so implicit roles when when we were diving into the dummy policy and working out exactly how all this was working, there was the these ideas of um, a target or self. You know when when a check access control check was happening. So. If, if you, there are certain operations that a domain was allowed to do to itself, and there's certain operations that if, if a domain is trying to do an operation on a target domain, and that target domain is referenced in a target uh, handler, it could do, it could carry out that operation. Uh, then you get into explicit role. And an explicit role, that is clearly a, a assigned operation that you're doing a specific check for having that role at the uh, policy checkpoint. Um, and so this is kind of how we split up these roles as we are laying it out into the system. Um, as I highlighted, right, so it, there's these implicit roles, and as I, I talked about self and target, but there's also the none uh, rule check, which is that you didn't need any role to at that checkpoint to do that operation. Um, as I covered the self one is if, if the operation is allowed to be done on a self, it's allowed to go through. If the operation is done, it needs to be carried on a, uh, against the target, and that's your target domain, then you're allowed to do the operation. Um, then you get the explicit roles. And as you kind of could see when we hinted at at the beginning, when we kind of generalized the uh, 
the general roles in the system, we came up with these explicit roles that is pretty much a one-on-one -on -one mapping to those. Um, the platform control is the platform management. Domain builder is the responsible for domain construction and deconstruction um, and destruction. And especially since reboot is pretty much a destroy, recreate, that means the domain builder role is necessary to reboot a domain. Uh, domain supervisor is the one that's looking out over all the domains, doing the lifecycle management over the domains. Device emulator is the one that's providing an emulation, uh, device emulation for, for a domain. Uh, device driver maps out to the PV backend. Hardware control is what actually is responsible for uh, allocating the hardware for, for domain usage. So that's that uh, hardware uh, lifecycle. Or I'm sorry, hardware setup. Um, and then the actual assigning and managing of the hardware after it's been provisioned for usage is the hardware supervisor. So from a top level implementation, so this is what, so you saw how we did the, uh, how XSM works today when you build it. With the XSM role patch, what we've done is all of these, uh, all of the uh, inline function checks that were in the uh, dummy dot H mutated and went directly into SM, XSM dot H and are the actual default calls for every XSM hook. Um, there is no, uh, the, the, the functions are always the ones that are called when the hook is called. What the, what it does for each of the uh, hook, um, function calls is it checks to see if there's been a hook registered, an XSM hook registered for that call and the, uh, the available XSM hook. And if it is, then it'll make the call into the, make that call to make the, the access decision. If it's not been registered, then it falls back and does the XSM role check. Um, and then in role.h, we took out the default action uh, routine that used to be in dummy.h, and we brought it here so that way this is the role policy, the static default role policy for, for this. Um, and so this, this will actually make all those role decisions as the uh, access inputs are made, uh, invoked. Um, so what what's the intention of all this? At, at the end of the day, what we will be moving towards is that um, in the past, XSM had this pseudo state of what's supported and wasn't supported. Silo was supported, but XSM wasn't supported. But you need XSM on to turn on Silo. Um, what we want to move towards is getting back to what you are accepting as being supported is just there. It no longer is turned on and off. It's just always present. And then we can worry about the actual policy modules, the silo policy and the flash policy, of uh, whether or not you want those enabled, and those can be individually uh, be in a supported or unsupported state. Um, one other thing we did as we were doing this is we recognized that the silo policy really is just an extension of the roles, um, just a, a, a restriction on the roles a little bit, and so we actually converted silo to be an extension of the, uh, the role policy and, and demonstrates how that can be done. So um, from an internal implementation standpoint, the way XSM roles works is that we uh, assigned a UN32 to the domain structure called XSM underscore roles. It allows us to have 32 distinct roles available within the system. I don't think we'll ever need that many, but it's still because it's a form more than what we have today, but at least it leaves it open for growth if need be. Um, we went into the is control domain, is the is then sort and is hard to wear domain checks, and we converted them to leverage the XSM rules bit field to make those decision points. So that way, when you're assigned the role that is effectively the control domain or role, set of roles, if it's more than one that needs to be defined, um, that check has now been converted to, to inspect that. Um, the one exception is for is hardware domain. It not only does it check that the bit field is done, but to ensure um, that we only ever have one hardware domain at a time, there is a global reference. This is to help speed up 
uh, because this this hardware domain is called many times throughout the kernel, so we do not want to have to do a chat, uh, you know, flying the domain or when when the the hardware domain is needed to do a uh, a check, if there's a it used to just pull the a global reference for it. So we kept that global reference there, um, and but we actually added a uh, a twice a double check there that is, that the domain does match the global reference and it does have a bit built. And it is hard work to make check. Uh, is system domain, is idle domain hasn't been converted yet. Um, it's kind of beyond the initial scope of what we were intending to do, but it is within uh, within reason to potentially convert that into the future. And as I said, you know, we went in and only XSM hook underscore, you know, whatever check is being done. Uh, we converted them all over so that way the the default is to if there is a um, an operation defined in the XSM ops structure, then we make that call. If not, then we fall back and we use the um, check to uh, the rubble check to see if it's allowed. Um, what else did I start? Um, oh, uh, on those checks in the past. The way it used to be done is that there would be a default crib that was passed when the hook was done, and that you could only pass a single one crib. With this change, the way we've done it is now you actually pass a, a mask of the roles that are allowed to make that hook. So that way we can now have that con, um, flexibility of not being of a hook being pinned to just one domain role. Got a few minutes left. All right. I got to blow through these. I apologize. Uh, how do you use it? So you don't need to do anything. With the you know, purpose of XSM roles was not to change the existing behavior. It was just meant to solidify the roles um, and formalize them within the Zen system today. When HyperLaunch comes available, um, you know the HyperLaunch will be able to have access and assign the same roles as it's doing. Um, I didn't put it on here. One of the things but that's in future work. I'll say that for that slide. Sorry. Um, so, what does it do? It doesn't do anything today that you will you will see. It doesn't change any public interfaces. It doesn't um, change any behavior, or the intent is not to change any behavior. That's why an RFC right now we need to validate that we didn't change any behavior. Um, and it's a foundational work to help enable. Um, you know, better so, uh, solid definition of Zen security controls. Bring up, some, bring some cleanup to the to the security code, and uh, enable HyperLaunch to do disaggregate start at uh, at startup. Uh, short term, we we want to address changes that may need to be done to enable disaggregated launch. Longer term outlook. Um, you know, we want to look at some of those extra hooks that didn't have explicit role check on there, get those added. Um, we can look at maybe exposing this through hypercall um, so that we, you can do role assigned domains to be assigned roles by the tool stack. Um, and, you know, eventually get more of the XSM policy module. Um, so in closing, I want to thank Star Labs, Adam and Scott. They they've been supporting the conference. They've been great and uh, encouraging us to get this up there. Um, and then a, a big thank you to Christopher and Andy as I'm tearing through this code and tearing through all the code and trying to figure out how it all works and going off on crazy rants and asking silly questions. They were very helpful and, and all of that. Um, so with the very little time I have left. Are there any questions? Have these um have been posted yet? I'm sorry, what was that? Have, have the patch been posted yet? 
the patch is up. Yeah, it's it's out on the uh, mailing list. Okay. Uh, there's a link at the beginning of the the deck. So see if I can get back up there. So there's the link to the actual patch set. Right. Um, so yeah, it's out there. And as I said, I released it as an RFC. I was it, it compiled. Um, I did my best to make sure that the it um, could be. Um, I say uh, that each patch should build on its own uh, within the patch set, so you can checkpoint the work if you find a bug, um, or more specifically, if I I can checkpoint the work to trace down a bug. But it, um, but the key, the key point was just to have a nice clean patch set that I know compiles and can boot. And I I have actually I launched a system and then ran some XPF tests on on top of it to make sure that at least some level of it worked. Yeah. So your mileage may vary. I, I have one one platform that I did it on. So yeah. So the the, the talk was really informative. I'm sure it will help in, in looking at the, at the patch set. So yeah, yeah. And the, the patch set I actually um, I broke it up into two stages basically. So the first part is I kind of took converted over to roles and applied those roles through the existing system, and then once I got that working and i you know did some uh, some minimal testing to make sure it was that I, I could get a system booting and do some minimal um, commands to the hypervised hyper calls um i then did the full conversion over of converting the dummy policy into the roles policy Um, I did throw up earlier, not too long ago, a design session for this. So if, if people want to ask more detailed questions and take a look at the patch deck with me, um, we, you know, if it gets scheduled, we can do that. Um, just express, if you're familiar with the design sessions, go express interest in, in doing it and see if it gets, can get scheduled this week. Okay. 